Okay, so first of all, welcome to the University of Chicago Paris Center. My name is Nadine Merler, and I'm the current academic director here at the center. Um, when I'm not here, I mean, I'm, in, I'm faculty at the University of Chicago. My own field is Egyptian archaeology, so it's very removed from what you guys are <laughs> coming here for. I'm excited to welcome you to the conference, of, which is called Three Days, on W.E.B. Du Bois, scholar, activist, and pastor between America, Europe, and Africa, foundations, circulations, and legacies. But before we start with the program, I would also like to officially welcome you to the center here and give you a brief overview of what we do here and what the role is within the academic community here in Paris. So a lot of you might have not really heard about um, the U Chicago Paris Center, so I thought it might be give you like a good overview of, of what we do. So it's been 15 years since the initial foundation, and our primary function is actually to provide the home and logistical base for our, our undergraduate study abroad program in Paris. So we have each um, academic quarter, so Chicago, U Chicago is on the quarter system, which is three months um, each time. So students from the college, so undergraduates, come here to spend three months living in Paris, and they are taking courses that are taught by UChicago faculty. So we have at various programs. Um, students can take classes in the humanities, social sciences. We have a program in neuroscience. And they basically get the courses taught by UChicago faculty, which corresponds to their programs. And they're not missing out or missing out on anything. So they can continue while they actually get to experience living in a, in a different place, being here in Europe. And they're also uh, learning um, a new language. So they get courses in French. And I should maybe say that we have a lot of different study abroad programs at the university in very different locations. But um, we have a only a few where we have a logistical base, like the buildings, the classrooms. Um, and usually those uh, centers have a much are much more attractive. It's just simply, simply easier to, to organize also for the students. So. Um, the other function we have is to provide a hub for U Chicago PhD <coughs> students and faculty. So PhD students and faculty who come here need to, need to do research. They want to use archives or libraries. And we provide sort of a base for them as well. Their office space upstairs they can use. And um, it just like, creates a, a nice um, collaborative community. Uh, we also um, help. Uh, faculty to organize lectures and workshops here at the center. So as you're probably aware of, in ma many times, and this is actually very true for my own field, we have a lot of colleagues who are based in Europe. And instead of um, paying a, a ton of airfares, um, and I'm not even going to talk about the carbon footprint, um, going to the US, uh, we actually have that workshop or conference here, which makes it much easier uh, for everyone. And um, then also, more recently, we have um, started to make an effort to increase our visibility within the French academic community. And we are offering our rooms, our lecture halls, um, to French colleagues. And we are really hoping to build more of a collaborative international community here with our um, um, colleagues from different French universities. Um, last thing we do is uh, we offer uh, events that are open to the general public. So we have, a, for example, a salon <coughs> with the University of Chicago Press. So authors come here, present their book, and uh, this is actually open to the general public. And we also sometimes um, organize uh, debates on ongoing political events. So it really depends. It's, you can see it's a wide variety of, of um, uh, lectures, conferences, and events we, we, we can host here. So um, in three years, we are actually planning to have a new center, because this has been pretty going pretty well and it's very popular among students. And um, we're going to get a, a building that's much bigger than this, this space. And the good thing is, it's just like up the road on the um, Avenue de France. And hopefully, in three years, we'll have that new center up and running. It, it will be an interesting. Um, change, I think. And we are all looking forward to just having more space and more facilities. So um, without further ado, first of all, um, I hope you'll enjoy spending time at the center today. And I wish you a wonderful conference. And I would actually like to especially welcome a group of um, students here, After School Matters Jazz Ensemble. 
were in the back. So welcome to Paris. We're happy to have you here and attending, um, participating in this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Well, I'd like to um, thank everyone for attending. I want to thank our Noah and his colleagues at the University of Chicago Paris Center and the scholars on the Scientific Organizing Committee. Um, keeping track of time, because when I do it in the hotel room, it takes 40 minutes, which means it probably take me three hours to do it now. Um, so I'll try to keep you somewhat disciplined. But I want to thank the scholars on the Scientific Organizing Committee for putting together this critically important conference. What I wanted to talk about today um, is um, the relation, how Du Bois analyzed race and capitalism. As many of you know, the subject of racial capitalism is one that's being studied not just in the United States, but throughout Europe, um, Africa, and the world, in fact. Um, American scholars are too ignorant of the fact that South African scholars and scholars in the Caribbean were dealing with the concept of racial capitalism before Cedric Robinson. Um, and others within the United States started grappling with this seriously. But much like the radical edge of Dr. King's thought has been erased in popular culture and to a significant degree in scholarship. Um, some of the radical edge of, of Du Bois' thought, um, the anti-capitalist aspect, the anti-imperialist aspect, has also been erased. And that's what I would like to talk about today. Unlike most of the scholars here, um, I am not a Du Bois scholar, although I've been reading and teaching his work for a few decades. I am sad to say a political scientist whose empirical work focuses on understanding black public opinion and the racial divide in the United States, and a critical race theorist in training, who has recently published articles often co-authored with my colleagues at the Racing Capitalism Project trying to understand the relationship between three systems of domination, the relationship between global white supremacy, patriarchy, and the financial, financialized capitalist social order. Du Bois' work has been critical for me, my colleagues, and my collaborators for seeking through the latter project. This year is the centennial of the first Pan-African Congress, which Du Bois played the central role in organizing. The themes included how to end racial injustice in Africa and the diaspora, how to achieve self-determination and, and decolonization, how to win economic justice in the face of a long history of exploitation and expropriation of bodies, lands, people, and labor throughout the Black Atlantic. A key question was how to do all the above in the face of a vicious, violent, global imperial system that classified Black, Asian, and brown people and often inherently inferior, and certainly minimally uncivilized and in need of white governance. Sadly, near all, nearly all of these same issues continue to confront us, if in new forms, despite punitive colonization, independence, and a mounting of fierce movements for freedom, national liberation, human rights, and black power. Today in the United States, just last week, black folks are shut down in their homes for doing nothing more than playing video games with their nephews by the police. Poor whites, despite dying earlier than they have in decades due to drugs, suicides, increasingly poor health overall, are proud to state that, quote, though I'll never support Obamacare because I don't want my tax dollars going to Mexican migrants and welfare queens, unquote, even though they would benefit by robust state health care system as much, if not more, than any group. Migrants from Africa and elsewhere in the global south are being preyed on and are dying in massive numbers due to centuries of devastation produced by the expropriation of colonialism and neocolonialism, as well as the capitalist devastation of land, flora, and fauna that has produced a climate change catastrophe that threatens the entire planet, but is currently felt most intensely in the global south. The predatory aspects or articulation of race and capitalism are displayed in the work of scholars and journalists, such as those from the Washington Post, that document how a tax debt of about 100 euros for, for an African American uh, family led to the confiscation of their home worth over 150,000 euros. And this is 
happening in black and brown communities throughout the United States. Sometimes, as scholars have documented, by outright fraud. But other times, for the shaping by the state of draconian tax regimes that make it easy for white capitalists to gain the homes and lands of communities of color for virtually for free. They buoyed across a number of works, identifying many of these tendencies decades before Deckard Robinson and those of us who work on questions of race and capitalism today <laughs> begin the scholarly, this scholarly inquiry. Indeed, I'll argue that Du Bois' framework has advantage over that of Robinson as he advanced in black Marxism. <clears throat> I start in part one of my talk, and this talk is a little bit disjointed because I asked to extend it at the last minute. <laughs> so, um, What's the key aspect of Du Bois' analysis of the some key aspects of the interaction of race and capitalism? I briefly outline what are some of the limitations of this approach. I then sketch in part two the framework my colleagues and I have been developing for addressing some of these questions. I primarily rely on three texts in order of importance just for this talk. They are The World in Africa, Black Reconstruction, and The Fifth and the Color of Democracy. Um, lurking in the background, for me at least, always is Dusk of Dawn. Uh, and to a lesser degree for this talk, Souls of Black Folks. Um, and certainly, if anybody knows Souls, knows how the degree to which, uh, or knows suggested, um, Du Bois was very much taken with black spirituals um, um, as one of the most important artistic products of the people at the time that he was writing. I start with Du Bois' own views on what some of us the National Race and Capitalism Project, which I co-direct with Professor Megan Francis of the University of Washington, his analysis and articulation of white supremacy and the Catholic social order. So what does Du Bois' analysis continue to offer us today? First, he talks about a global system of white supremacy that ties together analysis of colonialization, imperialism, the growth of industrial and finance capital, with a brutal system of white dominance that is not just part of the precursory of capitalism, as Marx seems to argue at the end of volume one of Capital, nor an anachronism, as other scholars have argued, that is not tied directly to capitalism per se, but is, Du Bois argued, instead historically, intrinsically necessary for capital accumulation, not only in the past with the emergence of the modern global capitalist, capitalist system, but also during the period that Du Bois wrote about, and we would argue is part of the ongoing accumulation today. Du Bois argued in the world of Africa, quote, with this new world came fatally the African slave trade and Negro slavery in the Americas. There were new cruelties, new hatreds of human beings, and new degradation of human labor. The temptation to degrade human labor was made vaster and deeper by the incredible accumulation of wealth based on slave labor, by the boundless growth of greed, and by the worldwide organization for new agricultural crops, new techniques in industry, and worldwide trade, unquote. Indeed, finance capital was built off the slave trade, according to Boyd, unquote. However, this wealth was, was obtained, uh, however pious, the regret <coughs> at the messes of its rape there could be no doubt as to what became of it. Its owners in the main were not rural spinsters, not aristocratic dilettantes. And even if some were, their financial advisors put their funds largely into safe investments of West Indian slavery and the African slave trade. Thus an enormous amount of free capital, safe investment, and permanent income poured into the banks, companies, and corporations, the powerful British institution of the stock exchange was born, unquote. Modern scholars such as Caitlin Rosenthal shows how, show how modern accounting and management practices could develop for the efficient managing of large-scale slave plantations, while the work of Michael Ralph, for example, also demonstrates that the strengths of four out of five of the largest U.S. insurance companies was built in large part on the insuring of the slave trade in the United States. It wasn't just agricultural capitalism, and industrial capitalism that was built by slavery, but the finance capital that dominates this era will also have their origin in the slave trade and slavery itself. A consequence, though, uh, illogical consequence, 
this material, very strong material consequence, was that, quote, the theory of race arose. There came a new, and this is a quote from Du Bois, there came a new doctrine of universal labor. Mankind was of two sorts, the superior and the inferior. The inferior toiled for the superior. And the superior were the real men. I'll talk about Du Bois' gender analysis a little bit later. Um, inferior half more or less. He continues, quote, the word Negro was used for the first time in the world's history to tie color to race and blackness to slavery and degradation. The white race was pictured as pure and superior. The black race as dirty, stupid, and an ugly inferior. The yellow race as sharing in deception and cowardice. Much of this color inferiority. While the mixture of races was considered the prime cause of degradation and failure in civilization. Everything great, everything fine, everything re really successful in human nature was white. Okay. Now, in Europe, I hear, in the United States, I know, there are right wing populist movements who have crafted that line of politics about. The superiority of white civilization and the need to recover it. And these here are some of the themes of the great work of propaganda last century defending white supremacy. The 1915 path breaking American movie, Birth of, a, Birth of a Nation, was critical for this process. Thus, we see the modern form of anti blackness emerged through Du Bois' writings with the emergence of global white supremacy and the modern capitalist order. Du Bois shows how this system. And this is one of the controversial aspects of his writing on race and class. That not just class formation, but classes themselves and their perception of themselves were shaped by this system. He famously argues in Black Reconstruction that in the United States there were two proletariats, one black, one white. And that the white proletariat, I think this is sometimes misunderstood by American scholars received not only psychological benefit, but material benefits as well. For example, and he stated, despite the fact that the 19th century saw an upsurge in the power of laboring classes and a fight toward economic equality and political democracy, this movement and battle was made fiercer and less successful and lagged far behind the accumulation of wealth because in popular opinion, labor was fundamentally degraded and the just burden of inferior people. Luxury and plenty for the few and poverty for the many was looked upon as inevitable, the course of nature. In addition to this, and what is all saying, that the white people of Europe, and he also meant the United States, had a right to live upon the labor and property of the colored people of the world, unquote. Note that an important aspect of this argument is that democracy for all is harmed by the embrace of white supremacy, not merely by the rulers, but by the white working and middle classes. Black bodies were stolen and became capital and labor. The economy saw dispossession, dispossession, displacement, theft of land, expropriation of labor, and genocide in various combinations in Asia, Africa, Oceania, and America. The result, with respect to Africa, although Du Bois makes clear this applies to other colonial regions as well, quote, the products of Africa began to be shared and distributed around the world. The dependence of civilized life on products from the ends of the world tie the everyday citizen more and more firmly to exploitation of each colonial area. Tea and coffee, diamonds and gold, ivory and copper, vegetable oils, nuts and dates, pepper and spices, olives and cocoa, rubber, hemp, silk, fibers of all sorts, rare metals, including the ones that go into this, Valuable labor, fruit, sugar, all of these things and a hundred others became necessary to modern life. And modern life thus was built around colonial ownership and exploitation. He continues, extreme poverty in the colonies was the main cause of wealth and luxury in Europe, unquote. He later uh, states that the actual value of capital goods at the time of their investment in Africa, as compared with the realized value of labor and material, taken from Africa by investors and other claimants, legal and illegal, but if known without shadow of a doubt, proved the enormous theft which Europe has perpetrated on people deliberately made helpless before greed and aggression, unquote. 
And this was part in response to the scholars of his time to argue that Europe was, was not, was, that the colonies were economic loss with respect to Europe. And he was saying that was absolute, utter nonsense. He also demonstrated that while each system of domination was maintained, they evolved, and as we'll see those like Sadia Hartman argued in the second part of this talk, that, the, that evolution leads to a new articulation so that the hierarchies of race stay essentially the same. But how the domination manifests and evolves, although anti blackness is always a feature of rule, white supremacy, and violence is always a central tool for maintaining racial rule. Du Bois is explicit about this in Black Reconstruction when he states, indeed, the plight of the white working class of the world today is directly traceable to the use of slavery in America, on which modern commerce and industry was founded, and which persists to threaten free labor until it was partially overthrown in 1863. The resulting color class founded and retained by capitalism was adopted, forwarded, and approved by white labor, and resulted in subordination of colored labor to white profits the world over. Thus, the majority of the world's laborers, by the insistence of white labor, became the basis of a system of industry which ruined democracy and showed its perfect fruit in world war and depression. Unquote. Although the articulation of white supremacy and capitalism changed over time, as I suggested, one constant feature is violence and maintaining rule over the non white populations of the world, and a constant example is the extreme viciousness of. <coughs> of the use of force by the state and white civil society against black people in the US. Part of the motive is economic and driven by the logic of capital, according to Du Bois. Du Bois argued in Black Reconstruction, quote, the price of the slave produce in the open market could be hammered down by merchants and traders, along with acting with knowledge and collusion. And the slave owner was therefore continually forced to find his profit, not in the high profit price, excuse me, of cotton and sugar, but in beating down ever further and further the cost of his slave labor. This made the slave owners in the early days build the slave by overwork and renew their working stuff. It led to widely organized interstate slave trade between the border states and the cotton kingdom of the southern south. It led to neglect and the breaking up of family and could not protect the slaves against the cruelty, lust, and neglect of certain owners. So it's not necessary that we have bad people who are slave owners. It's the logic of capitalism itself that directly produced the cruelty and exploitation and expropriation in ever-increasing cycles in order to maintain a reasonable profit base. You can put everything I just said in the post. He is very clear about the roles, though, that blacks played as agents to gain their freedom. Racial justice and prosperity, he argued, from 1825 to 1860, the American Negro went through hell. He yelled in desperation as a, as a slave power tried to make the whole Union a slave nation and then to extend its power over the West Indies. He became the backbone of the abolition movement. He left thousands of fugitives to freedom. He died with John Brown and made the North victorious in the Civil War. For a few years, he led democracy in the South until new and powerful capitalism disenfranchised him by 1876, unquote. And he also noted decades before black neoliberalism became the poison that has become the past few decades, that the role that some black elites play in maintaining particularly class rule over poor and working class blacks. Although he notes that sometimes the aspirations of the black bourgeoisie were, at least in part, partially frustrated by white supremacy. Perhaps most importantly, Du Bois makes it clear that you cannot analyze racial hierarchies and racial oppression without analyzing imperialism, colonialism, and capitalism. And you can't study capitalism without analyzing the role of white supremacy plays and plays in sh shaping the capitalist social order. You can't understand the nature of democracy and politics such as that of the United States. <laughs> of the United States, again, from Black Reconstruction. <coughs> The true significance of slavery in the United States to the whole social development of America lay in the ultimate relation of slaves to democracy. What were to be the limits of democratic control in the United States? If all labor, black as well as white, became free, were given schools and the right to vote, 
what control could or should be set to the power and action of the labor works? Was the rule of a mass of Americans to be unlimited, and the right to rule <coughs> extended to all men regardless of race and color, if not what power of dictatorship and control, and how would property privilege be protected? This was the great and primary question, which was in the minds of the men who wrote the Constitution of the United States, and continue in the minds of thinkers down through the slave controversy. It still remains with the world as a problem democracy expands and touches all races and nations, unquote. Or as Frederick Douglass stated in his famous 1852 Fourth of July speech to the boys, quote, quote, what to the American slave is your Fourth of July? I answered, the day that reveals to him, more than all other days in the year, the growth, injustice, and cruelty he, to, to which he is a constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and a holy license. Your national graceness dwelling vanity. Your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless. Your denunciation of tyrants, brass fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, cobble mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings, with all your religious parade and solemnity, are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy, a sin veil to cover up crimes which would disgrace a nation of savages." Unquote. Du Bois agreed with Douglas, and many still ask that question today, although slavery in the United States has long re been replaced by other forms of racial domination. In Black Reconstruction of the World in Africa, Du Bois is crystal clear about the critical role social scientists and current historians play <coughs> in spreading false histories, erasing history, passing bias as objective truth, for creating, maintaining, and reproducing racial hierarchies on a global scale. He is equally clear about what our role needs to be if racial, economic, and social justice is to be achieved. So Du Bois argues, quote, there can be but one adequate explanation of this vagary of 19th century science. It was due to the slave trade and legal slavery. It was due to the fact that the rise and support of capitalism called for rationalization based upon degrading and discrediting the Negro Especially significant in the science of Egyptology arose and flourished at the same time that the cotton king reached its greatest power on the foundation of American Negro slavery. We may then, without further ado, ignore the verdict of history, widespread as it is, and treat Egyptian history as an integral part of African history. Unquote. He continues his critique in Black Reconstruction, and we don't just see the Academy's complicity increasing the ideological underpinnings for white supremacy, but also for the central component of anti-blackness. And the silence is active, as Du Bois clearly stated in Black Reconstruction. Quote, in regard to the 10,000 wrongs of American slaves, you would enforce the strictest silence and would hail him as an enemy of a nation who dares to make these wrongs the subject of public discourse. This is still true as today, as evidenced by the FBI among other state agencies, saying the peaceful movement for black lives is more dangerous for years than the literally murderous movement of anti-Semitic, African Latin X, anti-Muslim, anti-black, <coughs> white nationalists, who are the only domestic political tendency in the United States to repeatedly murder large numbers of Americans. Very briefly, what is missing or wrong or what has changed? And I'm keeping this brief so that this will be part of our discussion during the q and It's an open question, at least in my mind, about the contemporary rele relevance of the pan-African socialism that he so strongly embraced in the world in Africa. Has the time passed to, quote, put on the beautiful role of pan-African socialism? There was on Du Bois' part a naivete at best or a more willful willingness to ignore the authoritarian aspects of actually existing socialism. This is, of course, a mistake my generation made as well. Culturally, just as Greg and Caitlin described in Black Contrast Propolis, the black folks on the south side of my hometown of Chicago in the 1930s, while respecting the work of the Communist Party, were at best be amused by black 
Tatra even running around in Russian clothes, which I would argue was no worse than the Mao suits and Chinese garb that my generation of black radicals adopted. But far worse than the questionable fashion choices were the reliance on foreign models of revolution without analyzing the nature of capitalism, oppression, and white supremacy in the United States. Morally, each generation's slowness to condemn the crimes committed in the name of revolution, while understandable, is ultimately inexcusable. Critically, sometimes my students claim on encountering Du Bois that he lacked a gender analysis. That is incorrect. He had one in his patriarchal. I'll spare us some of the more offensive passages, but it's demonstrated in practice, such as his role in screwing the great black anti-lynching activist leader and writer Ida B. Wells from the leadership of the NAACP, the then newly formed black civil rights organization, the NAACP, from the leadership of that organization, who believed that it was men's role to lead, and for that matter, men of a certain class as well. <coughs> Analytically, we have to look beyond Du Bois to puzzle off the relationship between various systems of domination. Um, my colleagues and I don't use the term racial capitalism because we believe each, each system of domination has its own logics, its own hierarchies, which in turn are associated with their own sets of privileges and factors. Male privilege is real and material, and so is white privilege. Although recently some students in the United States at Georgia Southern University recently burned a Latina scholar's books because they objected to her analysis of white privilege. The university defended them, saying it was part of free speech. As we'll, see, as we'll see, we argue that the articulations of each history of domination with each other in a given historical period, we call that a regime articulation. I should make clear that was one of my co-authors cautions me in particular, this is a work in progress. It's early days for working out our theoretical historical arguments. We are skeptical if respectful of the racial capitalism framework because we believe it is spirit of semi-autonomous logic of each system of domination, and how, and how, while they usually reinforce each other, they sometimes clash due to frictions between them. Let me now turn to part two of this talk, where I introduce the theoretical framework that we're trying to develop. Black series from an earlier generation were clear as Du Bois was on the centrality of both capitalism and anti-blackness to black oppression in the United States particularly the oppression of the most disadvantaged sectors of blacks in the country. For example, Diane Berger reminds us that Black Panther prison leader George Jackson centered the racial oppression of blacks and, cap and capitalism in his staging call to combat white supremacy and capitalism. Jackson had declared, and I quote, the economic nature of racism is simply not an aside. Racism is a fundamental characteristic of monopoly capitalism, unquote. We claim that our approach is useful for understanding how each of these systems have associated them with some privilege and hierarchy. <coughs> and how the, the uh, analyzing these associated sets of privileges facilitate the analysis of who are potential allies as well as the type of friction that are likely to emerge among potential allies. <coughs> these frictions emerge as a result of how different claims are advanced at different times by different groups of people who are fighting patriarchy, white supremacy, and capitalism. Historically, these regimes became established through three criminal and overlapping processes. The global dispossession and genocide of indigenous peoples throughout the world, including Africa. The enslavement and commodification of African bodies through the slave trade and slavery. And the continued conquest and expansion of empire, including lands that had already been colonized by foreign power such as the southwest United States, and lands that were taken by the, by the U.S. as a result of the intra-imperial war, Spanish-American war. The global establishment of modern white supremacy and capitalist social order accompanied these processes. The foundation of this approach was laid in my and Megan Francis' essay, Black Politics and Neoliberal Racial Order, published in 2015 in Public Culture. In that essay, we argued that white supremacist racial order changed over time as racial domination must be attained through the changing interaction of civil society, economy, and the state. This analysis was further extended in our article co-authored with Emily Koshenstein, titled Articulated Darkness, White Supremacy, Patriarchy, and Capitalism, Shelby's Dark Devil, published in June of this year in the Journal of Political Philosophy. That article focused on regimes of articulation, a historically specific art 
iteration of, of the three systems of domination. So I'm going to use slavery in the U.S. as an example of a regime of matriculation. <coughs> and, and it usually takes a massive event or rupture to transform these regimes. The areas of slavery with the U.S. represent a particular interaction of, of, of these three systems of domination. The articulation of white supremacy and patriarchy slavery had different consequences for white and black women and white and black men. Parchin Spiller notes, quote, while confusing and enriches a picture, it's precisely the sameness of anonymous betrayal that adheres tenaciously across the division of gender. In the vertical columns of accounts and ledger, the terms Negroes and slaves denote a common status. Unquote. All three systems of domination intersected to define the content of gender and race for black men and women during the slave era. The articulation of these systems of domination was not an additive process. But Hartman argues, how can we discern the crime as a legitimate use of property? He's talking about black bodies. Hartman continued, however, it's important that the decriminalization, which is a big one, of rape not be understood as dispossessing the enslaved of female gender, but in terms of differential production of gendered identity, more specifically, the adequacy of meaning of gender in this context. Therefore, what is at stake here is not maintaining gender as an identitarian category, but rather extending gender formation in the relation to property relation, the sexual economy of slavery and the calculation of injury. Unquote. As Spillers, Hartman, and others have argued, gender was mutually constituted as white supremacy within a capitalist social order, and same could be said of race, or for that matter, one's class. During this, one transformation that occurred during slavery was birth was, was transformed and reproduction are transformed because, quote, genetic reproduction becomes then not an elaboration of the life principle and its cultural overlap, and this is Spillers again, but are an extension of the boundaries of political and property. To that extent, the captive female body will be precisely a moment of conversion of political and social vectors that mark the pledge at the prime commodity of exchange. Unquote. Black bodies were not only a commodity, however, but a key source of capitalist wealth. And not only southern planters, but, you, but the U.S. economy, and for that matter, the British economy as a whole. As historian Walter Johnson and others have demonstrated, <coughs> during the height of the anti bellum period, half in the U.S., <coughs> slaves represented the greatest amount of capital in the U.S. Quote, their value in 1860 as a slave was equal to all the capital invested in American railroads, manufacturing, and agricultural land combined. All three systems of domination reinforced by the racial state that held any act of violence by a white person against a slave justifiable. Violence by the racial slaves, by slave owners, by any white person who so chose was the glue that ensured its error and exploitation continued uninterrupted. <coughs> The black body, to some degree, was constituted by the violence generated by the racial state. This is an excellent. <coughs> These examples remind us, as Kastenstein argues, that racial subordination is a form of rule, and Campy argues that it's a form of authoritarian rule. With respect to racially subordinate populations, there is no velvet glove. Violent coercion is the norm, not consent in any reasonably understood. I have a long quote by Fred Bonter that I'm going to skip about his view of you know, systems of articulation. But I do want to remind us that regimes of articulation can be reconfigured over time. And Sadia Hartman, once again, provides us with an excellent analysis of how the racial state adjusted to change from the regime of slavery to that of Jim Crow. Quote, although no longer the extension and instrument of the master's absolute <coughs> rule and right or dominion, the laboring black body remained a medium of other power, of other's power and representation. If the control of black was formally affected by absolute rights and property of the black body, <coughs> dishonor and the quotidian routine of violence, these techniques were supplanted by the liberty of contract, the spawn debt peonage, the bestowal of rights, the engendered indebtedness and obligation, and licensed native forms of domination and coercion and the cultivation of a work ethic that promoted self-discipline, induced internal forms of policing, spectacular displays of white terror, and violence supplemented these techniques." Unquote. 
I would note that the deadly racial violence that marked the regimes of Jim Crow and today differed from that of slavery. During Jim Crow, the, performed, the preferred form of anti-violence was lynching. <clears throat> and the end result of the reorganization of both capitalism and white supremacy within the United States and the reorganization that produced a new regime of articulation. Emily Pashenstein and I argue in the JCC article that regimes of articulation produce a dynamics that not only reinforce the dominance of each system of domination, but also pressure points that provide an opportunity for progressive socialism. Specifically, we contended that while white supremacy and patriarchy often are functional for capitalist economies, for example, they can also come to conflict with the logic of capital, capital and generate tensions, crises, and contradictions. White supremacy may mobilize both in order to safeguard and maximize profitability as well as to mitigate economic crises. As Ida B. Wells and many other late 19th and early 20th century black activists and writers document the naked violence of Jim Crow from both the state and white citizens who used used to materially dispossess black individuals, dispossess black individuals and communities. This occurred through brutal violence, including lynchings and pogroms. The latter have been very much erased from the standard tale of US history, such as the 1921 attack on Tulsa's Oklahoma black community, as well as confiscation and fraud backed by the racial state. The racial state has often backed the racial segmentation of markets, including housing, labor, and credit markets, which has led to the super exploitation and expropriation that heightened the precarity of black and brown communities. They also generated the pressure points. Most of these pressure points are generated by crisis, and which political forces would benefit is highly contingent on the historical context and the political balance of power. Although forces and capital and reaction have had a terrain, at least up to now, strongly stacked in their favor. For example, the series of crises that began in the 1960s and are culminating in our time are often argued to be the result of a strike between labor and capital. I think of works by people like Greta Kirchner and Wolfgang Street. Yet they should be also understood as being the result of global and domestic, with respect to U.S. articulation of white supremacy and capitalism. Globally, the anti colonial struggles and domestically black and allied insurgencies that occurred through the 1960s and 1970s put pressure on both capital and the racial state. On capital, as newly independent countries with some degree at least initially able to renegotiate terms of trade, in some cases such as with oil with dramatic effects on the world economy. Domestic black insurgency demanded an end to discriminatory markets that's also potentially coming into, as did some of the gains won by the women's movement, into domestic profits. Within the US, the racial state was fast as meeting the demands from black and other social movements. Sometimes through the direct provision of demanded resources, but more often through the either symbolic gestures or the provision of credit. State debt became a vehicle first for the partial provision of resources demanded by social movements, then increasingly as mechanism for funding the basic function of government were hamstrung by increasingly draconian neoliberal austerity regimes. Similarly, the extension of consumer credit <coughs> to, to black and other subordinated communities served initially the dual function of providing resources to households in these communities while all having to engage in politically dangerous redistribution, while also trying to tie these communities more directly to the yield for financial capital. As with state debt, consumer debt became increasingly a mechanism for many working and middle class families to survive as wages and income stagnated for all but the very richest Americans. The pressure on the racial state occurred, and the state had to manage successive waves of crisis as capital relied on the state to manage demands for increased state spending as a result of demands on multiple social movements. The state task of managing racial conflict was made more difficult as growing segments of whites across classes began to resent black gains in particular and resist the state efforts to address black demands. And the logical conclusion of that process occurred in 2016. The culmination, which is global in nature, can be seen by the current legitimacy crisis through which <coughs> In, in, through the global north and declining standards of living combined with poverty movements that have overtly racist components. Yet we simultaneously see increased mobilization in the US of black radical movements allied with other movements that are mounting sometimes successful challenges of both white supremacy and the predations of racial, racialized capital. Adopting the articulated systems of domination framework helps us to theorize the contradictions that aid and hinder progressive political mobilization and result of partially complex sets of privileges and oppressions in turn help us explain historically contingent patterns of conflict and cooperative between social movements. 
Let me conclude. The genius of Du Bois is not unlike that of Malcolm X, but to have a searing, critical, informed, no-nonsense analysis of racial and economic oppression that historically affects black people throughout the world. And Du Bois' case, a serious attempt to analyze the roles of capital and capitalism in black oppression. The genius of Martin Luther King and black feminists, such as those of the Tabagi River Collective, was, 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 able, was also able to, was to enable to imagine a world within which we could all flourish. And for the black feminists of the 1970s and 1980, as well as many black youth organizations today in the United States, that meant also imagining a world without patriarchy and heteronormativity. Over the past few years, I've emphasized using the approach of pragmatic utopia and pro rooted in the black radical tradition. Utopian because we do not allow our imagination to be fettered by ruling notions of the possible when we consider what type of world we must build so we can all have a chance to flourish. Pragmatic because we need strategies and tactics based on a rooted understanding of conditions as they are and a hard headed analysis how we get from where we are to where we desire. Usually I, I emphasize the utopian side. To break through the neoliberal shackles of common sense so that we can imagine the community within which we need and want to live. But you also have to emphasize the pragmatic aspect, the aspect of politics and yes, economics. Not as defined by the narrow disciplines that are not only captured by neoliberalism, but are in large part responsible for the neoliberal trend. Pragmatic in the sense that we have to think through what forms of politics and economics take. We think about the social design by egalitarian democratic movements or institutions that can justly account for and maybe adjudicate just claims that may, if we are not careful, become conflicting and we are not inherently so. We build on the work of Du Bois and others so that we understand we are part of a global struggle against domination and injustice. To understand that our work can make a substantial contribution to life and death struggles of those fighting literally mur murderous forces of injustice. To learn from Du Bois, the scholar in the best sense, best sense of the world, who would embrace Guinea Bissau's national liberation movement leader, Amakal Cabral's dictum, tell no lies, claim no easy victory. To learn from Du Bois, that we must break down the artificial barriers between academic disciplines and between scholars and activists. Thank you. Also considered by even many leading uh, feminists, black feminists, as the leading male feminist of his era, and that, <clears throat> and that when you look at many of his writings, such as *The Damnation of Women*, and uh, you look at his writings in uh, fiction and so on and so forth, uh, black women are centered. So, I mean, even Angela Davis made the argument that Du Bois and Frederick Douglass were the leading male um, um, uh, feminists of their era. And so I think that it seems to me then that what we have here in Du Bois is on the one hand a leading feminist and, a, and on the other hand one who trucks in uh, patriarchal kinds of analysis and, and, and leaving out uh, women scholars, like you said, uh, Ida B. Wells and so forth. So I think it's a much more uh, complex and complicated thing than just saying that he had an analysis and it was patriarchal. So that's, that's one point. The, uh, the second point is I think it's also uh, unfair to, in a sense, compare 
Malcolm X and Du Bois. Because in the final analysis, their roles differed. Uh, for <coughs> Du Bois, it is true that he was a major activist as well as a scholar. But I think that he failed considerably as a leader of his people in the traditional sense of the term. In many ways, Du Bois led his people through a pen, through writing and scholarship. I think that on the other hand, Malcolm X was a, 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 a man who had very little formal education, learned uh, his education while studying in prison, and drew on people like Du Bois, who had been trained as a scholar. So I think, I think to, to, to say that Du Bois was like, had some superior analysis and so on that Malcolm X does not, in, does not really look at them in a, in, a, in a kind of fair, comparable sense. I'll take the second point first, because I think you may have misread what I was saying. Um, about Malcolm X and Du Bois. Um, the comparison I'm making was actually a, a, a generous comparison in that they both had very strict analysis of black oppression in the U.S., even though um, I would consider Malcolm X to be much more the classical organic intellectual that comes out of the working class, out of the movement, mm -hmm. and that is able to crystallize complicated ideals and communicate um, with the people he's trying to lead, um, while Du Bois was a trained scholar. Um, could, you that, quote, could you quote? Could you go back and quote what you said? Is that right there mm -hmm. for you? Uh, yeah. Well, right there, that wasn't a clutch. <laughs> <laughs> OK, this is where I, I prefer to have additional versions that people search for. Well, it's okay if you can't find it. Yeah, it's toward the end. Let me give you one more page. Oh, I said the genius of Du Bois, not unlike that of Malcolm X, was to have a searing, critical, informed, no nonsense analysis of racial and economic oppression <coughs> historically faced black people. Okay. All right. Yeah. I, I accept your. Uh, yeah. Um, the first one, I would say, I would probably be more sympathetic to you to to, um, to what to what you're arguing. Um, Partly because this talk is based on a very narrow set of his writings. It doesn't include the fiction, doesn't include some of his later. And as we all know, know um, both the curse and, and benefit of living as long as he did is that you change over time. <laughs> um, so in the, I would say in the writings that I'm looking at that are in the middle, um, you know, most of them are in the 1930s and 1940s, the writings themselves and, and as well as his practice in the early 20th century could be easily classified as patriarchal, but it is more complicated, I, I would agree, than, than I stated in the talk. Other questions? Thank you very much. I would like to know how, uh, this is again on the Malcolm X issue, in terms of the organic, uh, you know, leader. This is crazy what I'm about to say, but this conception of, of W.B. Du Bois and the caliphate 10, 10 percent, uh, this debate was opened and ongoing. It still bleeds a bit with the debate between W.B. Du Bois and the issue of, of um, Mr. Booker T. Washington and that whole debate about whether or not the issue of freedom for um, black was through the book, through knowledge, or work. And that whole question of just selecting just the talented 10% versus the entire population. And it's, it's been a painful discussion, and I won't think it's resolved, but let's see what you think. Um, it's certainly not resolved. There's a leading scholar who's once again at Harvard, um, who wrote a book with another scholar at Harvard about the talented tense. Um, so um, the idea of talent tense, um, I think, is quite well ensconced in black intellectual circles, and it hasn't disappeared um, at all whatsoever. Um, 
from my own point of view, one of the weaknesses and one of the ironies of uh, Du Bois' views of Catholicism tends to be very easily transferable to a Leninist conception of a vanguard party. Because <laughs> again, you have an elite group over the masses, right? Um, although there is, I mean, I could talk hours about, well, we, I won't, I, 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 we won't go back to those debates. <laughs> um, but there, there's always a sort of elitism in, in his political analysis. And this is why I think, this is one area that I think Malcolm X is, is, is uh, considerably different. There's not the same strand of elitism. Now, where I think Du Bois and Malcolm X are more similar than someone like Booker T, they since they, all of them would insist that blacks need self-determination, need to lift themselves up, need to be grounded in economic work. But Malcolm X and Du Bois also wanted black people to engage in politics. They were not going to put politics to the side while trying to uplift themselves. So in some ways, Malcolm X sometimes, I mean, you know, black radical tradition is complicated. Um, so on some issues, they're more alike, and on other issues, they're, more, they're, they're quite a bit different. Professor Francis. No, Why is my co-author going to jam? I just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm not going to jam you at all. I want to uh, actually return to Professor Morris's first question here um, in terms of the patriarchy, um, kind of the aspects of Du Bois. And I actually want to return to that, especially in the first, the 1900s, 1920s, and 1930s. And so, um, but I think that this moment here that it's, I, I want you to, I was hoping that you could say a little bit more about why you think it's important to focus on this aspect of Du Bois. I think it's lost oftentimes in the way in which we talk about Du Bois, especially his interaction with Ida B. Wells and how he basically gave her the cold shoulder, removed her from the formation of the NAACP, very much took her idea in terms of the fight around racial violence to the NAACP and moved forward with that. In internal documents, we know, of course, that he writes that um, Ida B. Wells and Marlon Trotter at the time were seen as too radical to be involved in this type of black struggle. Um, but you know, I, in terms of this earlier period, I, I was hoping again that you could speak a little bit more about, I mean, you said it a bit flippantly, but I do think that there's a lot of value in thinking through that. Obviously, Professor Morris and you, this exchange I think was really valuable in the sense of how much things change and how the boys actually evolved a bit on this issue, but some of the early kind of ways in which he acted, especially also around white women, Ray White Ovington, as an example, are problematic. So I was hoping you could say a bit more about that. Look, I mean, I think I, I'm being a little flippant, not about what you said, what you asked, which is which is critical, but in terms of my response is that I'm not a Du Bois scholar in the way that that Alden and many people in the room are. Um, from my Understanding of the of the oeuvre is not is substantial, but not but certainly not anywhere near um, comprehensive. Is a good way to put it. Um, I think part of what I've been influenced by is the interpretation of some historians. Uh, I'm thinking of people like John Hood, um, one of Alvin's former colleagues, Charles Payne. Um, who talk about, and I believe Wells' his own autobiography, um, which obviously has her own point of view, um, about that interchange in particular. Now, and I, I tend to see the, the, the exclusion of Trotter and, and Wells slightly differently. I think there was sort of a mutual understanding, if I remember correctly, that Tr Trotter and, and was saying, nah, <laughs> I, am, I am too nationalist. <laughs> For the next formation, which was an interracial formation that became the NAACP. Well, I, it's not, it seemed to me that there was more acrimony and something else going on um, in addition to the radicalness of the uh, of Wells that, that led to her exclusion. And certainly, some scholars have pointed to um, complications around gender uh, for that exclusion. Um, Part of what generated my comments today is uh, reading through um, Black Reconstruction, I know some Black Reconstruction, um, the way that um, Du Bois talks about the role of black women and white women under slavery, particularly white women, is not one that I would consider from, from a gender point of view, from a feminist point of view, at all progressive. Um, so 
at least when he's writing, he has a different, he has a certain view of what womanhood is. And the other thing I think that is very, at least in the text I was reading, it's very, very um, central is the use of the word men uh, when it comes to anything relating to black citizenship or advancement. It's not black people, it's black men. And this is tied as um, I think other um, colleagues of ours have written to his Republican view of citizenship, which is what led to a, a fight between him and some of the black, so other black social democrats around World War One, is that black men can earn black citizenship through fighting for the U.S. forces in World War One, while the others, such as um, A. Philip Randolph, are saying, "No, we're not going to participate in a peerless war." Um, so. Du Bois did have a, a mask on his view of citizenship, at least during the early 20th century. And again, I would argue that, uh, as many of his views did, I mean, one of the reasons I love uh, uh, Dusk of Dawn is he talks about how his thinking evolves and his, how his thinking evolved in response to the predations of white supremacy, how he is no longer able to take a liberal <laughs> approach uh, to fighting racial injustice. So on a number of questions, including those of gender um, his, his thinking does evolve, but in the works I was reading today, the patriarchal aspects stood out very strongly. We have one question here. Okay. Yes, thank you for your talk. Uh, um, I have a question that I'm barely able to formulate, but I think I'll try. Um, it's, it's not so much a Du Bois question, but the question is based on the talk that I just heard, and then I guess it's more of a Dawson question than a Du Bois question. Um, <laughs> I, 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 as I was listening to you talk about uh, drawing from Du Bois uh, uh, on uh, uh, the ways in which um, capitalism, uh, slavery, uh, uh, is very in just the function of the capitalism and, and all the cruelty involved with that is also grows functionally from the capitalism. I'm wondering how you would transpose that into the present and what you would do with the new Jim Crow, all the things that Michelle Alexander writes about in the book out here today. Um, in what respect is that regime functional capitalism? That's two questions, but I'll focus on one. I'll focus on one of them in particular, uh, which is the question of how does um, racial domination function for capitalism in this period? Um, one of my uh, <coughs> co-authors who was, wasn't able to join us today, uh, Emily Cashman, so is writing about this in her dissertation, um, but. One of the aspects of financial, one of the things that is understudied in, in the U.S. is how how white supremacy works with financial capitalism. And one aspect she's paying attention to, and as have other authors, she's not the only one by any stretch of imagination, is is looking at the subprime crisis. So just as I as I mentioned um, that I mean as, Bo as I was quoting Du Bois directly, the logics of capital as to the increased cruelty of the slave master to generate profits. Um, due to producing cotton in the United States, sugar in the Caribbean, or an international market, um, the incentive structure that lenders had at places like Wells Fargo Bank in the United States um, they didn't ne did not ne necessitate um, for people issuing loans to be racist themselves to produce racist outcomes that led to massive uh, degrees of the loss of property. Uh, in black and brown communities throughout the United States. So that's just one way. Um, the, I mentioned the article from the Washington um, uh, Post, but there's a, a, a historian named Andrew Carl who's written quite scientifically about a regime of state regulation that has led to the ability to use property taxes to confiscate black property. Um, well, not just primarily black and brown property. Um, so, and one of the one of our uh, colleagues at Georgetown Law School, uh, Casey Park, writes about how explicitly in the, in the colonial era in, um, in North America, markets were established on the basis of race and, in fact, produces value and, and the ability to, to garner credit. But then one of the things that happened as the economy got transformed is the racialization is still there, but it's erased and it, it's much more, it's not as visible as it was. In the, either in the colonial period, the early republic, the antebellum period, or Jim Crow. So one of the things they're trying to do is try to empirically tease out how forms of racialization in these new markets, um, um, where your credit score is as important as your ability to earn, um, how it plays out today. 
One more question. Uh, well, thank you for talking about uh, WB Du Bois today. I, I really learned a lot. Uh, going off what the previous gentleman said about capitalism, I was wondering if you agree with everything that uh, Du Bois said about capitalism and if there really is like uh, an alternative uh, market or something to, for, for us to use instead of capitalism. I think it would be impossible to agree with everything Du Bois said about anything because he changed so often. I mean, he changed over the period of his life. Um, do I think that I do agree with what he said that historically the emergence of white supremacy was was dictated and emerged with the emergence of capitalism. Um, that's one of the points I think of agreement across the liberals in the project, the oh, I don't know what you want to call them, post Marxists in the project. Um, that's the one historical fact that we have lots of unity, <laughs> unity on. There's disagreement, for example, um, and there's sometimes agnosticism about whether theoretically capitalism and white supremacy are tied together intrinsically. And I want to agnostics on that. I want to think about that more. Um, my co authors want to think about it more as well. We're not at all confused about the historical pattern, though. Um, so if we're agnostic, that means that. One, we think that experimentation has to occur. We haven't seen a form of capitalism that hasn't had white supremacy. Mm -hmm. One that hasn't made really good use of patriarchy as well to generate profits. Um, I'd be open to an experimental form where people try to do that. But I also think we have to experiment with non-capitalist forms. And what one thing that I think one of the things we can learn from Marx is we have to be very careful about the type of experiments that are occurring in places like Jackson, Mississippi, and um, Barcelona, and other in, in Italy, where people try to deal with non-capitalist forms within a capitalist system. Because either one of two things generally happen historically, going back to the time that Marx was writing to today. Either they get crushed, and this happened a lot with black communes in the 1970s that tried to opt out of the system. They were crushed by the state. Or they become, as sometimes happens in Europe, part of the capitalist system, maybe one that's slightly more um, friendly to their own workers, but they're still producing for a capitalist world market with all of the types of uh, intrinsic exploitation and systems, uh, aspects of domination. Actually, that's the best I can understand. Yes. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you uh, to the organizers of this. Uh, this is Gathering and uh, really uh, looking forward to the uh, presentations uh, here. And um, I can say that uh, when you mentioned the uh, talent of tent, uh, I think that issue needs to be inspected, needs to be uh, uh, problematized. And I think that uh, Du Bois, as you recognize and point out, lived a long time uh, and it changed over the years. The early Du Bois uh, clearly uh, was, uh, was more elitist in a certain sense. Uh, and um, uh, this notion of, of, of uh, white supremacy, the notion of the talent of ten, the notion of, um, of you know, people of various races uh, who have their talent of ten. This is one of the points he used to make. And he himself, at some point, thought he was among that talent. They boy me at some point. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and felt, that, felt that basically uh, he had more in common with other members of the talent of ten than he did sometimes with his own people. And he, he, he said as much in his mm -hmm. work. And I think it, this needs to be inspected. I think that. Um, this uh, thinking uh, goes back to the eugenics movement uh, in, in, in Europe at the time, uh, when uh, the language you get when you when you speak Philadelphia Negro, you sometimes feel that uh, the book is almost racist in its way, in certain ways, you know. And um, people who were at all intellectual that day and time spoke in that eugenics language. You can see some of the same things in Robert Park, if you read mm -hmm. his other work. Uh, you can see 
call it, let's go in here. Yeah, I, I think you can see this. But the idea of the Henry Jason room was to make the world better through genetics. And the talent tenth idea, I think, uh, uh, needs to be uh, uh, explored. I think there's a connection between what those, uh, what that movement talked about and what so many Americans talked about at the early, the, the early part of the century. To be an educated person, you had to sort of speak in that language uh, in, in, in that day and time. I think maybe Du Bois was no exception. You know. But anyway, I think that that needs to be explored. Thank you. I would agree with that. Um, certainly, in the early Du Bois, there's a very strong um, flavor of that the best people or the best men should rule each race. Um, and uh, no star Stark has an intent that he clearly saw himself as being among that. And one of his frustrations with white supremacy is that the natural bourgeoisie of, the, of, of African people couldn't rise to the top, form capitalist mar markets, extremely capital. And then bring the rest of, of black folks who were less educated, less talented along with them. Um, that's a very different model than what, for example, what, we're, what we read from him later, later in life. Not certain that he never totally abandoned. I don't know if he totally ever abandoned the talent of the test, but he certainly had a different model of what, what he had more of a proletarian revolution model of uplift toward the end than one of a national bourgeois, a natural and national bourgeoisie uplifting. Of uplifting a race. Um, and some version of, of the elitist vanguard model of leadership has not just been part of conservative black politics, but radical black politics as well. Um, and I think that's what certainly I would agree that's one of the aspects of 20th century and contemporary black uh, politics that we have to interrogate and criticize. Actually, I have a question. <laughs> Do you know if Du Bois, in his works, uh, advocates at some point the necessity of violence to get rid of uh, neo or to get rid of liberalism or capitalism? So I'm not sure about the later work. What I do know in that early period. Uh, I was thinking, I don't know why, but maybe I knew you were going to ask this question. I was thinking about this earlier before the talk, that the pro prohibition against the use of violence for moral reasons is extremely rare in black politics. Um, du Bois, Ida B. Wells, many others of that generation might think that advocating armed response was tactically stupid, but they did believe in the right of self-defense. Um, when mobs came to burn down your house, to burn down the presses. Um, du Bois said he would get a shotgun. Now, that's not the same thing as what you asked, though, which is um, the call for armed struggle. I can't think of an example of him calling for armed struggle to overthrow capitalism. Or for that matter, I don't know if he talked about armed struggle in respect to the African National Liberation Movement, but maybe Professor Morris or somebody else in the room can answer that question. Well, you know, I would say he advocated uh, black soldiers going to fight yeah. in the military. Yeah. Uh, hoping that that would generate freedom right. at home. Yeah. Uh, so I, think, I, think, I think also, I think also, I mean, in many ways, Du Bois was a pacifist, but I think at the same time, like Marx, he saw the uh, need probably for a race plus class revolution against the bourgeoisie to bring about any, like, you know, uh, liberation or robust democracy. Yeah, he talks about, I mean, he comes very close to talk, and not actually doesn't come close. He talks about the dictatorship of black proletariat. Um, and what he doesn't do in this part isn't because he's a scholar part because he's actually his best. He doesn't talk about how you get there. It's hard to imagine having a proletarian dictatorship that doesn't involve violence. So. Of course, yeah. Okay. Thank so, you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah.